I'm going to talk to you what is clinical research and how we are going to conduct clinical trials. Before I go into that, I just wanted to know, because I have my co-speaker, Dr. Uh, Sanish Davis here. Now, we all conduct several clinical trials in the field of medicine. So we just wanted to know that, you know, just like a survey, not to just to know that what you are all doing, but how many of you are medical doctors here? Can you put up your hand? So, so we can tone down our language uh, to that, right? How many of them are PhDs? Either you have finished your PhD or uh, doing a PhD. Okay. H how many of them are in uh, other allied health sciences, life sciences, like microbiology, biotechnology, pharmacology? There's a lot. So how many of them, you know, who are not at all involved in health sciences at all? You know, something, some other, uh, okay. It's great. I think it's a mix, so we'll tone down our language to that. Because clinical trial is not done by doctors, not done by, you know, hardcore researchers alone. You know, it's a huge team which contacts, so we all need you there. Uh, so today our talk will be, outline of our talk will be, um, you know, there will be five lectures in this short uh, three hours. Definitely we won't bore you, you know, we'll keep you alive and awake. So, so we'll have a talk on why uh, do clinical research and clinical trials, which I'm going to do that as a first lecture, which will be followed by how to develop a research protocol. You know, how are you going to conduct a clinical research? Before that, you need to develop a study protocol, your proposal, or whatever you call. How are you going to develop a research protocol? So this will be done by Dr. Uh, Sanish Davis. You know, he's got a several uh, decades of experience from um, a pharmaceutical industry in doing clinical trials. Next, I will briefly talk you to, through where you're going to do this, uh, you know, um, uh, clinical trial. So what type of infrastructure you need it. Next, you can't just like that go and do, you know, um, uh, clinical trials. You need to have a lot of people need to approve this. Several regulatory pathways in your institutions, in your departments, by the national governments, and uh, so on and so forth. So this again, uh, Sanish, uh, We'll walk you through that. The next is at the end, what are you going to do with that? You know, you spend so much of millions of dollars or my rupees in doing clinical trials. What are you going to use with the data? You know, are you going to just go and go to a conference and present or just write a paper uh, just to create your credits? Or you're going to make some huge policy out of that? So this is something what uh, we both will uh, 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 talk to you at the end so that uh, the whole session is complete, starting from A to Z, you know, doing clinical research, you know, till the end product. So before I um, give you example, so, so I was asked to speak, me being an infectious disease physician for more than 24 years, predominantly my work is a lot on HIV, viral hepatitis, in this since this pandemic, a lot on COVID and other emerging infectious disease. I'm an infectious disease physician, uh, trained in that and uh, managing patients and uh, researcher involved in conducting several clinical trials and drug development as well as other uh, biomedical interventions <laughs> for various infectious disease both in prevention and in you know treatment so so i'll be talking to you with that experience what i have gained in the last two and a half decade in my uh, practice and as well as in my research experience giving examples before I do that, I thought I'll give you, since you've got a lot of freshers, you know, about to know what is uh, clinical research, I'll walk you through, you know, a few terminology and uh, definitions on what is that. So what is a clinical research? So clinical research itself is a branch of healthcare science that determines the safety and effectiveness. In brackets, I put efficacy. Both efficacy and effectiveness can be same, but sometimes have a little difference, which I will you'll understand during the course of our presentations. It can be using medications or due to devices or certain diagnostic products or a group of medication we call treatment regimens intended for human use. So this is a classical definition for uh, clinical research. As I said earlier, it can be for prevention, not necessarily for infectious disease. It can be for even non-communicable diseases like diabetes, hypertension, certain cancers, can be for treatment, a lot of uh, clinical trials are done for treatment. And also, how to do a better diagnosis. You know, uh, 
in those years, uh, when you do certain diagnostic uh, uh, tests, it may take anything from four days to a month uh, to get your reports. So now you've got sophisticated tests, we can give you, you know, within a few minutes or uh, within an hour. You know, this is something you do clinical trial and uh, thereby you improve the diagnostic capability in various uh, institutions. And also clinical research is very different from clinical practice. It's very, very important. What we do in a clinical practice, for example, you go to a doctor with fever, with some sore throat, he'll give you, in, in your clinical practice, what we give based on the guidelines or his own experience that you. So what we do in clinical trial is little deviated from that because why we do that is because we want to establish a better treatment options. So you should not compare clinical trial and the routine clinical practice very, very important, you know, where uh, the, the, the drugs what you prescribe to your patient for any disease is all well validated, it's part of the guidelines after clinical trials had been done. So what we do in clinical is something new. Many times when you do clinical trials, you may not succeed all the 100% of the times. Might be 60%, 70%. Like for example, now we got a disease called HIV, which we all know that now it's almost 40 years old in India, 30 plus years old. Till today, we don't have a vaccine. So we have tried a lot of, we failed, failed again, again. Now I've been involved in several, investigated in several such trials, and we are never able to make it. But on the hand, COVID, we just came in, within two years, you know, we hit the nail, you know. I don't know whether it went right directly or a uh, little deviated, which you'll see in the next couple of years. So, so, so there are a lot of ways, what I'm trying to say is, what we do in clinical trials or in clinical research, we may not succeed. So that means when you're a researcher, if you're not finding something new, don't cry, and uh, don't be sad, don't be depressed. You know, sometimes you do that to improve something else. Again, I'll tell you, uh, we did a lot of research in the field of HIV, so for many, many, many years. Many things we failed. All those principles, what made us to fail, in that we are used today in COVID, to find quickly. All these mRNA vaccines and some of the newer antivirals, which we have been using in our clinics, in our patients, as well as some of the things in pipelines are all being developed, or uh, the uh, mechanism was developed for HIV, now it's been repurposed for COVID. So that means when you do something, may not be directly going to be applicable for a disease, might be that can be used for something else. It's something like Nobel Prize. If you see this, there are people who are all 80 years old, you know, or 70 year old, you know, they get a Nobel Prize. He used to scratch it, said, hey, what he did this, you know, at this age to give a Nobel Prize. You know, what he showed in the year of 45 years on something on a molecular pathway, today it will led to the development of a new diagnosis or a new treatment or a pathway, you know. So that's something, that's what's been Nobel Prize has been, you know, awarded. So similarly, what do you do something today you may not get the fruit immediately. You might be one of those, you know, go to Sweden to get the Nobel Prize. Just to charm you up and get to encourage you, so everyone should get involved in somewhere on, you know, you know, clinical research. So there are different types of clinical research. So today, in our, uh, in this session, mostly we'll be talking about clinical trials. But on the other hand, there are a lot of types of clinical research. I want to sh show this slide, thinking that we'll have a different types of uh, uh, participants here, not only doctors, not, not only health science people, even other uh, individuals also. So we have a treatment research, uh, which we'll talk uh, predominantly today on this. So this generally involves interventions such as medication, there is a behavioral therapy or psychotherapy, or using new devices, or new approaches to uh, uh, surgical practice, or in, in cancer on certain radiation therapy. So this is something what is called the treatment research, where you want to test a new intervention for a better care. And we do have what is called prevention research. So this looks for ways to prevent certain disorders, either from developing or from coming back. So now we are also doing research how you won't develop COVID again, you know, right? People are developing again three times. I have patients, I treat COVID almost every day in our clinic. So there are patients whom I have treated uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, 20, and 2021 20, yearly, uh, the same patient was in the ICU. Then again, yearly this year, again, been infected. Now I had seen a patient like fourth time developing COVID. So, so he's asking, hey, what do you to prevent this? You know, why I have to keep come to your hospital again and again? So, so this is again, how you can prevent something, uh, what's happening, you know, there are a lot of uh, research currently happening. So that type of prevention research is very important, not just on 
uh, vaccines uh, alone. So there are different types of prevention research. It can be medicines, it can be vaccines, it can be even simple vitamins or minerals. You know, today, you all know that 90% of the Indian women, so they have low, uh, less uh, vitamin D. You know, you go to any doctor, they'd say, they ask you to do a vitamin D, they said, hey, vitamin D. So now this, is, this has been present. So we have been supplementing, you know, vitamin D3 to prevent uh, bone fractures, uh, you know, to improve the bone health. You know, that's again, uh, following a certain prevention research and also certain lifestyle changes to prevent certain non-communicable diseases like diabetes and hypertension. So that all can be done using, uh, you know, this type of uh, research. And also we do have what is called diagnostic research, which refers to the practice of looking at better ways to identify a particular disorder or condition. One of those typical examples is take tuberculosis. So when somebody is coughing, we take the phlegm out, send it to the lab, they'll give you a report after six weeks or sometime after three months. They have to grow them, find what drugs are going to work on that, and they'll give you the report. So by the time you do not know what to give to the patient, and also the TB, they can also spread to others, their household members and people in the community, and by the time it can become very severe also. So today we have, following extensive this diagnostic research, we can diagnose TB within one hour. Somebody gives a phlegm, Within one hour, uh, we have got a test called Gene Expert, which is a molecular test, which will give you whether the person has got tuberculosis or not, and also whether it has been resistant to any of those common medicines what we have been prescribing. Now, these are all these being developed because of that type of research that had been done, like or various diagnostic research um, using certain newer uh, molecular techniques. So that's again also research. So why I'm saying this is because you've got life science students, many of you might be working in laboratories, you know, doing very innovative biomedical research. Don't think that doing certain medication for treatment, which we are going to talk alone, will get you to a Nobel Prize. No, you know, even such diagnostic stuff has also been very important. If you don't diagnose, we're not going to treat. Now, today we are able to diagnose COVID, so we're able to isolate or treat with whatever tools we had. Similarly, this diagnostic research also advances treatment. There are various screening research just to find out, you know, whether people, whether they have malaria in this community or filariasis or dengue or uh, any of those diarrheal diseases or quickly to know whether people have certain types of diabetes. These are all called screening research. So again, research is not alone using a needle or a medication or uh, using one of those uh, um, uh, high-end uh, equipments. It's also simple counseling. So this is what is called quality of life research, you know, trying to understand what proportion of people in a community, so they have forgetfulness, or they have been depressed, or they keep uh, having some type of a behavioral issues, you know, and based on that, how you can do better intervention like psychotherapy or behavioral therapy to change them. So these are what is called qualitative research. So again, this quality of life can be either quantitative, just collecting specimen, and also you can interview certain people. These are called qualitative research. I'm not going into the detail because the topic given to us is more of a clinical research. But these are also examples of research. Since you've got individuals here as delegates from different disciples, you know, don't think that clinical research alone, the one you, know, you should do if you want to do research. You know, there are a lot of other things you can get involved. Again, the principle is the same. Then genetic studies. This is something picking up so much. You know. So today, there are various, uh, we, we can sequence your whole body genome and uh, we can say that what are the diseases you will develop in the next 20 years. Similar like an astrologer, you go to an astrologer, they may tell you this may happen to you, you do this, do this. I don't know whether that might be right or wrong because I don't believe in that science, but sometimes it can be right. So here, by doing uh, gene sequencing, we can identify what are those diseases you might develop, you may not develop, you can avoid certain things and everything. So again, to do this, just by doing genetic studies, trying to understand various gene sequencing, we can do that. So these type of studies are becoming very, very popular now, you know, off late. You know, these are all something in the very future. This epidemiological study is something a lot of people do. You know, even in COVID, there are many people who have come to your home from your corporation or a municipal council, try to take your blood, try to know the antibody, how many of you exposed to COVID antibody or uh, uh, in TB or, uh, you know, various uh, other uh, disorders. So these are our simple epidemiological studies, so which have been carried out. This again, trying to understand 
uh, what uh, proportion of people in certain location or in community have been diseased with certain disorder so that a particular intervention can be focused you know, towards that uh, particular uh, area. You know, this is something, again, this type of studies are widely happening in India. I, I think this is, again, another way where you develop various intervention models. So these are various types of research. Again, again, a lot of other types of researches are there, so we will not cover about that. So today, the focus of our talks will be mostly on clinical trials, so how we can advance new medications. Thereby, we can pop the new medica older medications and trash the existing medication, which might be good, but on the other hand, we may trash it for various reasons. So while doing a clinical trial, there are various uh, phases of uh, clinical trials when clinical research is used particularly to develop new medications or for devices. So we have got different phases. Now, when a pharmaceutical company, X, develop a medications and say, tell, uh, tell us, hey, this can be used for this particular disease, we're going to use it. We're not going to use it. They have to go through various process, <laughs> even for them, to um, um, you know, to get it uh, registered or to get it approved, they had to go through various phases to test whether the medications are safe, they are tolerable, is really efficacious, can be given with other medications, what dosage are to be given, then only the appropriate uh, regulatory authorities, which my other co-speaker will talk to you a little later. Um, uh, uh, then, based on those different studies, what we do. So these approvals have been given. To start this, the first one is what is called the phase one trials. So what they do is um, uh, researchers test an experimental drug, X, or a treatment. It's a combination of the drugs. Now many times in infectious disease, we don't give one drug. We give a combination, like in TB, in HIV, the combination of antiretroviral drugs in hepatitis C. So we give many things. Same thing they give in other non-communicable diseases too. So we do give this in a small group of people for the first time. So these are individuals never exposed to these medications, or the whole world is never exposed. These are all new entities, chemical entities, <laughs> which are being tested for the first time. So what uh, the researchers evaluate is, first they have to evaluate it is safe. We can't give something, people are get killed. Or you give something, they keep vomiting. Or the whole body become rash or anything. So you can't do that, you have to test them. So now, before we give in to the human beings, these drugs are also being tested in a lot of in animals, in guinea pigs and rats and rabbits and so many other animals on the tolerability and everything. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk more about the human research. So once that safety is there, then we do this in a, um, in a human beings or as a phase one trial. So again, phase one trial, we don't do it in a very large number of people. It's a very small group. It could be anything from 20 to 100 uh, individuals is depending upon the type of intervention. So mostly we do this in a healthy volunteers. People have got no disease. They are perfectly fit. Then you may ask a question, hey, who will come to you just to swallow this medication? This again, to advance science, we get these uh, healthy volunteers. There are uh, certified clinical research organizations you know, who conduct this uh, to promote science. And also these phase one trial in certain condition can also be done in deceased individuals. So again, phase one trial don't uh, show whether that drug will work or not. It will only establish whether it is safe, whether it is swallowed, can be swallowed, or it should be given as an injection, or um, you know, this particular quantity is acceptable. You know, for example, if you give 20 tablets to an individual, the drug might be wonderful, whether it has to be swallowed uh, within five minutes, no one is going to take it, right? So these are something what we study in such in phase one studies, trying to understand whether drugs are tolerable, it is safe, is all being you know, acceptable. So once it passes through this, the next phase is, is a phase two. The phase two is more in this experimental drug or treatment is given to a little more larger number of people. Here again, we will study whether it's really effective and also further also evaluate the safety because it's going to be studied in a little more larger people. For example, if you develop a drug for diabetes, so we have got certain end markers, you know, their blood sugar, whether it is being controlled, or if it is for cholesterol, the cholesterol coming down, or if it is for HIV, whether the virus level goes down, if it's for COVID, whether the symptoms quickly resolve, whether they are not getting hospitalized, or if it is for 
any other uh, malignant lesions, whether people are getting a quicker response to those therapies, thereby the spread of those cancer cells can be prevented. So these are the things which are being studied in phase two in a very, very uh, in a smaller scale. Not a very small like a phase one, but in a little more larger. <laughs> we study any time from 100 to 300 individuals. These numbers are picked up, again, based on the drugs and based on the indication, and also based on the regulatory bodies which are going to advise. There are certain intervention regulatory bodies says, okay, 100 is enough. There are certain things like US FDA, they may say, you may need around 250 to 300. So on a safer side, so, uh, when we do this type of research, we keep us a little more larger scale so that it can be widely generalizable in terms of uh, a regulatory pathway. So once they pass their phase two trial, the next step is what is called a phase three trial. So again, we do phase two, phase three, only if it has passed through the phase two. In an analysis of phase two, which we'll again talk about at the end, it is, we find that it's not gonna be effective, not gonna be safer. Again, we're not going to move further forward for the phase three. So the, the drug will be killed, or it will be repurposed, or it will be fine-tuned. For example, if you give a dosage of 1,000 milligrams, got more toxicity, we may tend to reduce the dose. Or you give a 20 milligram, it is not effective, we may increase the dose to little more 50 milligram or 100 milligrams. So again, in a clinical research, so we have the leverage to, you know, to move around you know, these medications around. So when we do a phase three, it has already gone through all those uh, different uh, endpoints in phase two. So this will be studied purely in a disease people. For example, if you're doing a uh, research in COVID, these are people aren't doing a COVID. You know, I heard, just heard that your hospital is doing research in COVID patients. So you do want COVID. So um, again, uh, here, the researchers confirm the effectiveness of this drug, how it is work, whether it can cure a disease or prevent the disease progression or make sure that they will not develop this disease again. And also we'll monitor the adverse effects, side effects. And here, there, when we do uh, this clinical trial, we'll compare this with the current standard of care. So we need to have something, a gold standard. Now today, you have a drug X for diabetes, which every doctor prescribes. So when you are uh, developing a new molecule, that should be compared against this X. Otherwise, we will not know that whether it is really working or not, whether it is better or not, and also the regulatory bodies are not going to give you approval. So it should be uh, studied against the current standard of care, which again, I'll give you a lot of examples when I walk you through some of the trial. And phase three trials will be a little larger. It could be anything from 1,000 to 3,000 individuals. You know, there are trials which we do sometime around seven, 8,000. Sometime regulator says, this particular intervention, if you're going to do this, you may need a little more larger sample size so that you'll have a lot of data to analyze and get some statistical association so that it can be used for certain you know, indications or try to find certain you know, side effects. And again, the duration of the trials, again, varies from disease to disease. In trials like in HIV, which I'm going to walk you through a lot of uh, examples, a trial should be carried out minimum six months. If you just do it for a week or no, or 10 days or two, two months, it's not, you're not going to see the results. At least you give a drug for six months, then you'll know that whether the virus is going down. So if you are going to give a drug for COVID, you are not going to wait for six months. You need to know within seven to 14 days whether their disease is preventing because COVID is such a quicker viral disease. You know, somebody develops today, within seven days, either it resolves or it further progresses where push them to the hospital or to an ICU. So, so you focus your endpoint you know, for that duration of follow-up. There are some uh, diseases like hypertension and cholesterol. You need to do a larger follow-up for a year or two years, not only just controlling your cholesterol, whether you're able to maintain the control over a period of years. So these are all studied in uh, phase three trials, depending upon the indication, you know, we designed the studies, which again, Dr. Sainish will talk to you more on that. As I said earlier, all those which are studied up to um, uh, phase two are not going to make it phase three. So many of them will get killed. So based on various surveys, only around 25 to 30% of the drugs had advanced to phase three. So remaining 75%, pharmaceutical company would have spent millions of dollars on that in developing that molecule, studying phase one, phase two. We researchers completely killed the product, you know, because we did that 
not intentionally, but in the uh, safety of those uh, you know, indivi deceased individuals. So only a few will make it. So again, um, don't think that phase three is dangerous. You know? So these are all gone through a lot of phases. Only uh, um, uh, one fourth of them will go to the phase three after the phase two. So we have got what is called phase four. Once someone passes to the phase three, they can get certified by the appropriate regulatory bodies, which uh, Dr. Sanish will talk to you, and they can register the product and they can market, and it can become part of the treatment guidelines, and we physician can prescribe for the diseases. Once that is done, and again, the regulators or the, um, uh, uh, the companies who develop that, they also like to develop certain phase four data. What is that is, you know, you are used part of the routine uh, uh, clinical practice. So why we need such data is, when you do clinical trials, you are going to do only a small number of people, right? Thousand, three thousand. You know, that is again, large number, but still very small as compared to the population. But when you prescribe to a very large number, we may tend to study this drug, how it is safe in different population. For example, sometimes we may not study this in pregnant women, right? Many times when you do trials, we exclude pregnant women for various reasons, or some of the regulatory bodies don't uh, allow us to do. But in a routine uh, practice, you prescribe a drug. You know, a woman can come and get for, for some disorder, they can become pregnant while taking this medication. So you may have this data, very important phase four data to know that whether it has been harmful or use or it has been safer to the fetus. Or in a clinical practice, many times we develop this data in elderly people. In many clinical trials, we don't involve people with 70 plus years old. So because very difficult to get them into the trials and get them into all the study related procedures. So in a practice, you use some and generate data in different population, in different reasons. So again, in a phase four trial, you get a variety of data from a different population across different ethnic groups, which again, some regulators will need this data for the continuous approval of the drug. So once a drug is approved in phase three, given to patients and marketing license given, and in a phase four, in a particular community, if you see some red signals, hey, you develop this type of side effects, then the regulators will flag the uh, pharmaceutical company, hey, this molecule has got some issues, then you may have to work on them. Either they'll stop uh, um, giving that, or they will redo the dosage or whatever it might be. So again, phase three trials also very m important, especially to advance uh, clinical research. So again, I've told you about various type of research, then you may ask a question, hey, why we all should get involved to do with this clinical research? So difficult, you have to write a protocol again, my next speaker will speak to you. There are so many painful regulatory pathways you need to go, starting from your own approval process. You know, why we should do, you know, somebody develops, company develops, anyway, they all have good faith, let us use it, you know. There are many food, you know, many uh, hotels prepare, not gone through any trials, right? You all go and swallow, yeah, right? You know, good pasta, just some manufacturer says you use it. You know, like this medication, why not you uh, just use it, you know? Why do you want to go through that? Why do you do clinical research? I'll give you an example. Now the next might be half an hour, I'm gonna talk purely my own experience in conducting clinical trial from the area which I've been working on. So I'm from a center, one of the largest infectious disease center in India. Uh, it's called Voluntary Health Services Infectious Disease Center, which I co-founded this many years back after I returned from the States after my training. It's one of the largest HIV care center uh, since 1996. So we have registered more than 20,000 patients and other than HIV, we also take care of viral hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and TB, MDR TB, all emerging infectious diseases. And since this pandemic, we are one of the largest uh, COVID uh, treating centers. I'm sure many of you have seen us in media multiple times. So on managing COVID. So we have all types of facilities available in, a, in our infectious disease center. And our hospital is located, our center is located inside a large multi-speciality hospital with cardiology, neurology, obstetric gynecology, and all the other uh, specialities. So where we provide a variety of uh, services for people living with HIV on counseling, testing, you know, various supportive uh, programs, and along with, you know, treatment services. So we have built in a clinical trials unit on the top of our clinical care program in collaboration with the US NIH, World Health Organization, and many bodies across the globe, including our ICMR, 
and uh, many other uh, Indian bodies, mainly to answer critical questions, unanswered questions in our therapeutics, especially in managing HIV, do we have better drugs? When to start certain medication? Whether these drugs will produce certain side effects in hepatitis B, hepatitis C, can we cure hepatitis C? Today, yes, by doing a research, we cured. And in COVID, do we have better drugs? Now, we killed hydroxychloroquine, which some of you have already swallowed, you know, so by doing a trial, which I'll walk you through all this. So, so in our hospital, you know, we did all those, which led to more than 400 odd uh, publications. I'm going to talk to you now purely our uh, experience on doing these trials. When uh, I, after, you know, my own experience after getting trained in the US in infectious diseases, um, written back to take care of Indian patients with HIV, is way back I'm talking about 1996, before some of you have been born here. So the type of infections, what we saw in the Western country, in the US and Europe and North America, in people with HIV, when they're sick, they develop a pneumonia called pneumocystis pneumonia, of course we also see here. There's a cancer called kaposis, and a type of infection called mycobacterium avium complex. So, so those years, we have HIV. We never had any good data from India, no data at all. We even do not know how to manage our own patients. So we used to refer the Western textbooks or the data being published there to look for in our patients. We did not succeed. It's around looking at that many of our patient, you know, we thought probably this is this and we didn't even diagnose or never uh, made anything. So those days, it made us to know, hey, the infection in your region probably might be very different. So that made us to start a simple database, not a very sophisticated research. I'm showing this because many of you here in the sitting in the audience, you're not going to do sophisticated clinical trials, which uh, I'm going to talk to you later and uh, followed by our uh, other speaker, but very simple research, simple epidemiological research. We set up a simple database in our clinic. Initially, those years in 1996, we didn't have any sophisticated uh, softwares, we in a simple Excel sheet, then, you know, Chennai being an IT hub, um, you know, those even those years, we started that, and uh, our uh, IT techs, you know, developed into a very sophisticated database now today. Any patient who come to a clinic, we capture all those simple information, their age, sex, how they acquired HIV, what are those various things they develop at the, what are the symptoms, like fever, cough, and anything. Um, then what type of treatment we offer, and uh, whether they develop any simple side effects to those medications with the dates. Because all those data earlier available, all were uh, from the Western literature or from the textbook. We never had anything. And uh, those years, people with HIV, they died just like that. I'm sure many of you have known that AIDS was a killer disease. Not anymore, right? So those years, we captured all those informations and everything in a very simple database. So when the first uh, 100 cases came, we just wanted to analyze for the first time in India, just to see what's those the most common uh, infections our patients go through. I'm sorry about this slide, it will move here and there. What we found in that is, the most common problem our patients developed here was tuberculosis, TB. Today everybody knows, someone have HIV, they can have TB. It was not known in the year 1996. I'll tell you, when I, I was the first author of the paper, like tuberculosis is the most common opportunistic infection in in HIV, you know, you know, way back in, I think, 97 or uh, 96, I think I published in you know, the international literature. So then since then, we started working on, you know, just to document. And on why this type of research is very important is, when someone with HIV, they are not going to develop these problems immediately. Some of the clinicians here know that, this graph, someone who develop a HIV, you know, it takes years and years for the CD4 cells to start dropping down, as shown by the blue color curve, then subsequently, they, the immunity, when they start dropping down, they'll pick up one by one infections uh, around them. So we found in India, someone around 500, 600 people with HIV, they can develop certain skin problems like herpes zoster. When CD4 is around 350 or 400, they can develop a tuberculosis and fungal infections. And when the CD4 cell counts are less than 200, they develop a pneumonia called pneumocystis, and it is 100, they can develop brain infections. We did this type of research mainly to educate our doctors. You know, just to give an example, in, we are not the richest country. You know, of course, uh, India is getting richer, but uh, not like in many developed world. Someone with HIV, they come with a headache. 
if they are with 800 or more CD4, we tell the doctors don't do a CT scan on an MRI on them. You know, don't waste the resources. It could be a simple migraine headache. But on the other hand, if the CD4 cells are less than 100 or 200, you look for some of those neuro opportunistic infection. It could be a uh, tuberculosis in the brain or it could be a fungal infections there called cryptococcal infection or a toxoplasmosis. So I think we did uh, this type of research trying to understand what is really happening in our region, how we can train our other clinicians to take care of our patients in a little more better way. So these also are uh, clinical research. You know, these are all epidemiological research you do in your uh, clinic by observing. You know, we didn't do anything different. Patients who came to you simply collected all the data from your uh, case sheets, put up in a database and analyze and try to find what, what you are going to see this year. And also, while doing so, we also found that, very interestingly, I'm going to uh, walk you through why I'm showing this is a little later is, while doing this, we also found that someone who got a tuberculosis, they got a 3.5 times faster progression to death when they have HIV. So that means if you want to prevent death in HIV infected people, if they have TB, do the proper test and cure them. TB is curable. Do a chest x-ray, get the phlegm out, do a proper test and cure them. Or prevent TB. If they don't have TB, today we have a preventive TB treatment called with using isoniacid or we have got a newer regimen with isoniacid and rifapentin. Just by giving three months, you can prevent tuberculosis. So I think this research really pushed the other researchers, hey, we need to find something for TB to prevention because we showed they had 3.5 times faster progression to death. Now this we showed many years back, almost 20 years back, we published this showing that how important to diagnose these infections. For example, someone who got a cryptococcal disease. So this is a very um, a difficult brain infection caused by a fungus called cryptococcus neoformans, which can kill people. We found that if they, people with HIV, if they develop this, almost seven times faster progression to death. So today we can prevent this. And again, as I said earlier, not everyone developed this. When someone who has got HIV, if the CD4 cell count is very low, they develop. So today, following this research, what we published 20 years back, World Health Organization has developed certain guidance. Hey, someone who is HIV positive, if they have low CD4, give this particular drug called fluconazole to prevent cryptococcal disease. So I think this type of research have led to those type of guidance to prevent certain you know, diseases. I think, again, research can be done you know, in a very, very different way, not just on clinical trials alone. So following all those, what have I said now, we have WHO has developed a lot for HIV-infected people. Someone who is sick, come to a clinic, you've got a package of care so that we can prevent various opportunistic infections and so many things. Now I'm moving to some of those drugs. As I said earlier, people with HIV, those years, 20 years back, we had no drugs. So it was like something like a killer disease. We used to counsel their ladies, hey, your uh, dear ones are going to live for another two months or six months, similar like a cancer doctors. But completely that has changed in the last 15 years because of the powerful antiretroviral therapy. So today, people with HIV need not die of the disease. I'm using the word need not die of the disease. If they are identified they have HIV, put them on the right treatment, and there are research shows that they can live like a normal people even up to 100 years. And there are research done in Harvard University have shown the life expectancy of people with HIV with medications is similar like in non-HIV infected people, right? So again, following all these antiretroviral drugs. So these drugs are so expensive. So when we started using this in our patients 20 years back, it used to cost almost like 15 to 20,000 rupees per month per patient. My richest patient, after a few months, they say, hey, we are running out of money. So it's so expensive because they're all developed by the innovator companies uh, in the developed world, so expensive. So that's a time the Indian companies, the Indian generic companies, they came up, they started developing this. The drug was so cheap. For a month, it used to cost, at that time, around 4,000 rupees. You know, today, 600, 700 rupees for a month. You know, it will be cheaper than many of your uh, cell phone, um, you know, monthly your cost. So, you know, we do have. When this was developed, we used to tell our, um, you know, uh, other colleagues in other parts of the world, hey, these drugs are so cheap, cheap, and now we are prescribing. Then the first question they used to ask us is, 
hey, are they really safe? You're saying it's cheap. Oh gosh, he said, it's great difficulty. We worked with Indian um, uh, companies to develop this molecule, get all the tech transfers. I still remember those days, I used to go to Delhi to get all the approval process for the Indian companies because we wanted to get on a compassionate grounds to our patients. And finally, they said, hey, it cannot be safe. You know, there are uh, different forums they started. They said, it cannot be safe, it was so cheap. That again, again, we went to the database after using some of our patients, we studied, and we published in the year, I think, 2001. We, I think, got accepted and took a couple of years to get published, stating that the Indian-made generic antiretroviral drugs are safe and tolerable effect. The first time in the history of medicine, no, for no other diseases, there are no publication had come on Indian-made generic drugs have been so safe and tolerable. Nobody has studied. You know, this we did in HIV. That paved the way for whole Indian pharmaceutical industry for all diseases across the globe. This HIV, when we did this, and they saved so much of lives, and they went into Africa, Latin America, and today, I feel proud to say that, you know, following these studies, Indian, I'm not uh, talking for Indian pharmaceutical company, they supply for 90% of the world for any diseases. You know, this has happened, you know, following, you know, this HIV research, which helped to develop these cheaper Indian-made uh, uh, generic antiretroviral drugs. Today, you go to any country, there are in their cells, you can make Indian-made generic drugs are there. These are all approved, used. Like, that's the only drug people could afford. You know, I was in UK um, so a few months back, and they said their country cannot afford anymore their own drugs. They want to buy Indian drugs. You all see that in the television now, how UK is going. You know, um, Gulf countries, they had all the resources on the earth. Now they are buying Indian-made cheaper uh, generic drugs because they cannot treat their population by using the drugs developed in Germany or in, or in uh, UK because it's so expensive. So again, this is a way where, again, you can do research, you know, in an unbiased way to help, you know, save a larger part of the world. Another thing is when we did this research, hey, it's safe, now let us all use it. So only the few private doctors in India, they have been using these drugs uh, in our patients. But our national program was not giving for free of cost, right? So it was being uh, used only by the private doctor. So we went to the national program. So at that time, our national program said, hey, how we, uh, where is the evidence that it really you know, prevents death? Now you're saying that it can be safe, you know, prevents the HIV, people can live longer. Then again, we went to the same database and showed that by year by year, we showed that it prevented death in HIV-infected people. Then we took this program to our national program to influence uh, policymakers. And today, I feel proud, more than 1.7 million people in India with HIV, they are getting free antiretroviral drugs. A lot from Pune, from your Sassoon Hospital and many of your municipal hospitals. Again, simple research can change public policy and save lives. So many, you know, so many 1.7 productive million lives, you know, you know had been saved and uh, they have been uh, taking care of families or they can be very productive, you know, across India. And similar databases are now set up in even other parts of uh, the world and to generate data and evidence from there. Okay, well, talking all those, so these are all epidemiological surveys and things. There could be bias. There could be bias in our clinic. And that then people might say, how can I use it in, you know, you need to do certain uh, unbiased clinical trials uh, to answer this. So to do this, we can do only by doing clinical trials. Again, next part of my talk, which will be followed by um, um, Dr. Sanish, will be on clinical trials. So we wanted to answer certain questions like when to start antiretroviral drug. I said earlier, someone with HIV, they are not um, going to die immediately or develop any certain opportunistic, it takes years and years. So you want to answer when to start, what to start, what to switch to. The next few slides I may quote a little quickly because it's just an example. Now I don't want you to again go through all our uh, clinical trials we did for you to learn anything, just as an example. To do clinical trials, it can be done in one site, like in your symbiosis medical school, or it can be in group of uh, hospitals here or across the world. So many times when you do clinical trial, you should do like a multi-site across the uh, globe so that you'll have data from different ethnic population, whether the drugs can be generalizable in different, different population in terms of side effects, in terms of its usages, as well as in men, women, children, adult, pregnant women, you know, all types of uh, different, you know, population. So US NIH helped to develop clinical trials across the globe, mainly in lower and middle income country, to study some of the newer HIV medications. So we want to answer a question, when to start this antiretroviral drug? At that time, we used to give, wait till someone's CD4 cell count in HIV goes up to 350. It could be within two years 
or could to up to 10 years. We used to wait till that and keep doing that to start on treatment. So, so we wanted to start study whether you can start at a higher of 500 CD4. And also, I said earlier, there is no vaccines for HIV. By treating someone who is HIV, can we prevent HIV transmission to their uninfected partner? So we see what is called zero discordant couple. Husband positive, wife negative, or wife positive, husband negative. So this is quite possible. By treating one other partner, whether they can prevent transmission by reducing the viral load. So we conducted this very landmark trial, which many of you have seen in, in, in news. You know, it was been there uh, uh, 15 years back. So we studied in zero discordant couple, one partner positive, another negative. In one group of individual, we started the treatment little at a higher CD4 cell count. That is when the CD4 count is at 500, 350 to 500. The guideline was, standard of care was not to treat them. The standard of care is to treat less than 350. But we deviated from the standard of care, but we want to test this intervention. So we studied this, followed them for 10 years. It was studied across a different globe. In, in India, we had two sites. One is in Chennai, another in Pune, your National AIDS Research Institute of ICMR. So what we found in the trial is, such a landmark trial, we found that it prevented HIV transmission to their uh, uninfected partner. Almost 96% chance of reduction of transmission if they're taking the antiretroviral drug if the viral goes to undetected level. Immediately, we published in one of the powerful medical journals called New England Journal of Medicine, so, and showed everywhere in the world, hey, this drug works by preventing transmission. And also, we showed it also prevent various infections like tuberculosis and so many infections. If you give it people with high CD4 who are perfectly fine, if you give that, it prevented a lot of infections. So immediately we called the WHO, hey, said that, hey, this drug, you have to give everybody. So at that time, the guideline in 2010 was, was to start treatment when CD4 is less than 350 or someone develop any illness. So following this, the World Health Organization changed their guidelines because you do a conducted a clinical trial across the globe in a very unbiased way and showed that it prevents transmission and as well as prevent various infections. Then come the question, hey, where do you want to leave the people with more than 500? So why not you try them? Then the guideline makers said that, no, we can't do that unless you come up with another trial. So again, you know, another million dollars has been invested to do a trial called START study. So what we did in this trial is, again, done across the globe. So I was also one of those uh, principal investigators of this trial. So we recruited people with HIV who are not sick with more than 500 CD4. At that time, the standard of care is not to give treatment. One group we gave treatment, another group we waited till the CD4 goes down. So what we found in that particular trial, it was done on 4,500 odd people across the globe. We found that it prevented both AIDS defining illness, we call tuberculosis, fungal infections, and other things, as well as non-AIDS complications like diabetes, hypertension, and so many things. So, so, and also several malignancies were also been prevented when you start antiretroviral drugs at a higher CD4. Following this, immediately, you know, we jumped and uh, said, these two trials, the HPT and 52 and START, both funded by USNIH, done in the best ethical standard, in a randomized way, showed that, you know, it prevents uh, transmission and prevents various opportunistic infection. And as a result, in the year 2016, the guidelines completely changed to from 500 to treat everybody. And today, because of the implementation of that particular guidance, and this is uh, projected by uh, WHO, will avert 21 million AIDS-related deaths and will prevent 28 million new infection by 2030. I'll tell you, the trials, clinical trials, what's been conducted in India participated heavily, Chennai and Pune, your own city, attributed to this across the globe, 21 million people, because you treat everybody. So you can see the powerfulness of doing clinical trial, which can change the whole world by preventing transmissions. I'm giving an example on HIV, like this in several diseases, people have done on it, because this, since I'm from this field of infectious disease, I'm showing this. So today we are able to do this. And following this, all the guidance in WHO, our national guideline, someone who is HIV positive, start treatment the same day. Don't allow them because they may transmit infection to others or they may lost to follow up. They'll fall sick and they come to you. Start treatment on, you know, everybody. Next comes the question, hey, you've got so many drugs available. You know, this looks like an Italian restaurant menu, you know, so many different uh, medications. Oh, you know, what are you going to choose? So again, you need to do different, different clinical trials so to do this. So at that time, so we were using a drug called sidovidine, which used to be a lot of side effects. 
But the Western world, they use a drug called tenofovir, but we didn't have proper evidence what uh, to be given. Again, we used the same clinical trials unit, what we used to do the other trials, and we found that the drug what we are using in India, called sidovudine, produce more side effects, producing anemia, body shape changes, particularly in women. So, so it should be completely, it should be removed. You know, only if you do this trial, then the guideline makers are going to change. Then immediately, the WHO um, um, started a group of uh, investigators pulled together and developed these guidelines stating that, hey, if you're putting on AZT therapy, immediately change them to tenofovir because to prevent side effects along with efavirenz as a single pill. Now the whole world changed completely within a year, including India, you know, completely changed. While doing this, then we started getting reports from clinicians, hey, my patients are getting depressed, or some of them have not coming back, we do not know what happened to them. You know, after many, many years, where large number of populations are put on that. Then what we did is, we did a retrospective review of all those clinical trials where they use this particular drug called efavirenz, which can produce a lot of CNS toxicities. What we found in that is, including a trial done in Chennai and Pune called 5175, which I used to be the chair of the study, and we found that this particular drug on efavirenz, in small proportion of the people, can increase suicidality. So they can attempt suicide, or it can also produce severe giddiness and dizziness. As a result, people don't take it. So we found in a clinical trial, we found it is very effective, and no side effects uh, in a shorter term, but on a long term, it can produce so many other things. We do not know anything on that. So immediately, also followed by another evidence that, hey, the prevalence of resistance to this drug is also being going up. Hence, again, WHO said, hey, this is time to kill the drug. So you did so much of money to build in a new regimen, but saved a lot of people, but on the hand, it can also harm you. Harm you. So you develop a new regimen. They said, you need to bring a newer drug uh, other than this. That made us to another trial, comparing the standard of care on efavirenz, again, a new drug called doltegravir, where we showed the newer drug, what we picked up, called doltegravir, is much more effective in terms of viral suppression, and also uh, shown by the side effects. In this particular trial, we factored in to count the side effects, because with the efavirenz, there are a lot of side effects, as shown by these yellow color bots, where in the other one, doltegravir, which is less, and following this, WHO and all the other guidelines, including our national guideline, completely changed to efavirenz to doltegravir containing therapy. So again, you do good clinical trials to bring in newer regimens, but on when you use them in a public health on a long run, again, you will identify you know, some of those adverse effects or other uh, things, then you have to kill the drug and bring a new drug. Again, clinical trials is not just a one-time affair. It is a continuous affair. Why I'm saying this is, there is a notion in the public, hey, these pharmaceutical companies, they keep making money by using these people and all those. You know, don't think that way. You have to think a little forwardly, you know, where, you know, where we do studies and trials. You know, I don't work for pharmaceutical company. You know, they bring in newer things and bring in newer technology. It is, again, to improve our own health. So unless we study them, we will not be able to do this. To do this, we need trial. Again, we did certain second-line trials to have a better things. Just for one time, I just quickly go into this quickly on this. Also, we did several trials on looking at some of the side effects. You know, for example, certain drugs we found that they are very good, like protease inhibitors. But when we did a trial and we found that, okay, the doltegravir content therapy is much better than this protease inhibitors. So we kill them and better to move them a newer regimen. So again, we, these trials are being a continuous process since I'm just wanting for a time, and I wanted to show that what I wanted to talk to you. Um, and also, while doing this trial, and in the guidelines, particularly when it comes to WHO, it goes to the whole world, because many national programs will start using that. When you start using them, then we will know, understand, are they really working very well in a large population for a longer period? Are they developing certain side effects or some issues in certain population? This has been captured in a phase four trial. That's what in a phase four, we develop these informations and pull them and give it to the guideline makers as well as regulators whether these, these drugs are really working. There's one drug called tenofovir. We used a lot, still being part of our national program, we heavily used for first line. And when it fails, we did a survey a uh, different continent, I was being investigated in this, in this study. It is not a clinical trial, it is an epidemiological survey. We found them, someone who fails to offer containing therapy in sub-Saharan Africa, almost around 59% of them will develop a resistance to that, and in Asia, anything around 39 to 40%. So that means you may not be able to recycle this drug. You may have to change them to a sidovidine containing therapy, which I said earlier, we used a lot in first line, 
which has got a lot of side effects. And when someone is failing therapy, you know, if you're going to use this, it will produce side effects. So how we can uh, change this? To do this, again, we aggressively did a clinical trial. There are two trials been done, one by the African group, another one still ongoing. So, so in this particular trial, what we did is, can we recycle the same drug, which has got a lot of resistance, till to show whether it works? There is a group of uh, researchers very aggressively built in a clinical trial. Uh, okay, again, uh, Dr. Sanish will talk to you about the design of this trial. Just to study, even with some drugs which fails, if you recycle whether it works or not. And they found that this still works. So that means when you combine it with other medication, it can still work. So it can be studied only in a clinical trial. This again, we did this because the drug which we wanted to use it for second line is more toxic. So we have already studied that. We don't want to use uh, knowingly, we don't want to use it. So we aggressively did this study and do this. So again, um, I just wanted to go quickly um, out of these things and since I'm just running short of time. So it's not only just uh, uh, doing clinical trials to cure a disease or to prevent a disease or a prevent a relapse. There are diseases like HIV, which is a chronic disease. Lifelong, they have to take treatment. But on the other hand, people with HIV also can develop certain other uh, conditions. So this is one of our work being published in Lancet from our group many years back. When people with HIV, when they put on antiretroviral drug, they'll never die. So we found in that, in this particular study, even after 10 years, only 2% died. You know, only 20 people remaining, everybody have been fine. But on the other hand, the people who are fine, they're still sick with some of those complications, like diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, cognitive problems, or some bone problem. We didn't know, hey, we put them on antiretroviral drug, suppress viral load, they did very well, their viral load has been suppressed, good CD4 count, but still they have been falling sick. But these are the disease been usually occur in elderly people because they live longer, they are inflamed. HIV induces a lot of inflammation, which has already been studied from very basic science. In COVID, we found that. And also many opportunistic infections like tuberculosis and many other infections, people with HIV also develop that. Because of that, people with HIV, even if they put them on good antiretroviral drugs, they can develop various other non-communicable diseases. And we wanted to study whether these antiretroviral drugs prevents any of those complications by suppressing these inflammatory markers. We all know that in COVID, we use a lot of steroids, which your hospital is also one of the site to do that. Because in COVID, there are a lot of inflammation, and because of that, uh, people develop various breathless and complications, and they died of that. You gave steroids, and various are anti-inflammatory, they became fine. So in HIV, so similarly, whether do you need to give something, anything on that, whether HIV antiretroviral drug develops that, prevents that. We found that in this particular study, giving antiretroviral drug did not suppress the inflammatory markers to that level to prevent any complications. Also in collaboration with ICMR, we also did a small scale study trying to understand the inflammation in people with HIV. Just for one time, we'll go quickly go into that. The outcome of that particular research have led to another very large, it's one of the largest clinical trial from NIH in HIV on 7,500 people. Now we are studying by giving statins to people with HIV can prevent whether non-communicable diseases, right? So we did several trials to make people live longer. While people living longer, which can also invite several age-old diseases, how we can prevent that? So now the trials have been developed, now still been ongoing. It may take another a year or so to see whether all people with uh, HIV should uh, um, you know, have some type of another drug to do this. I'll just quickly um, you know, wind up uh, by showing uh, something on COVID. And can I have another two, two three minutes? Okay. okay. So uh, as I said earlier, we, are, we run one of the largest COVID treatment center in Chennai. So more than 6,500 patients been treated in my unit. And we also did a lot of COVID research. Someone who had got COVID, so as doctors, when they come to a hospital, we'll say it's just a pulse oximeter. Some of you would have gone through that. If they have been breathing problem, saturation less than 94, they say, hey, you had to get admitted, put them on oxygen or uh, very severe, put in the ICU, put on a ventilator or CPAP. Remaining people, he said, hey, go home, you don't have anything. You know, that's what we did during this pandemic. So, so when you admitted them, we got various drugs. We got certain antivirals for COVID. And we have anti-inflammatory drug like steroids, which you have been studying now part of the care certain anticoagulants like heparin, we gave all those based on trials we did. Coming to these antiviral drugs, many of those drugs, what were used for COVID, were never developed for COVID. Were used for something else, like for malaria or for filariasis or for HIV or for Ebola, just the repurposed. 
So, but they have been given because people are dying. That thing was there. Just give something, whatever available, you know, just study them. So, while given them, then WHO came up with a very brilliant protocol called Saladidity Study across the globe in Europe. This is something where WHO for the first time united the whole world. So, despite there are a lot of critics around against them, but they did a superb job by doing this study um, in many parts of the world and studying different interventions. So, there are individuals who are given hydroxychloroquine. You all know that many people were treated uh, with this because we never know that whether it worked or not. People are given a HIV drug called lopinavir, a hepatitis C drug called interferon, and also they are also be given a drug called remdesivir, which you all know that people slept on the roadside to collect those medications and all those. You know, no one knew how it worked or not. So this particular study showed that none of the drug works. But we all were a big thing around this. You know, we quickly did. And of course, hydroxychloroquine, we all know that we never work. But we all thought is remdesivir, such a powerful antiviral drug will work because this uh, study was timely because I know that that in the media, people were lying on the road uh, to buy this from the black market. So we studied this and quickly published and on the whole media stating that this drug never works in people who are going to the ICU. Don't sleep on the road to get this, go back. You know, there are a lot of under interventions like steroid, what you are doing, doing here, you know, all being, you know, worked on that. So by doing this research, we found that, hey, these antivirals in people who are getting admitted for COVID will not work. But if you want to give any antiviral, you have to give them when someone's soon been infected. Somebody is with COVID, in the first four to five days is a, we call the viral phase. Then we call the inflammatory phase. So if you are treating somebody at this time, if you give any antiviral, not going to work. You have to give a steroids or if they're sick with, uh, or one of those other anti-inflammatories. But if you come at this level, you can give an antiviral. But on the other hand, there are very few percent of the people who will be sick at this time. I'm sure many of you have developed COVID, except sore throat, some scratchy or some running nose, even you would not have even gone to a, out of your house. You would have been fine. But on the other hand, 5 to 15 percent of the people, you left like that, you know, they didn't bother. But again, they went back to the ICU, you know, with severe complications. Can we prevent in them? So now there are serious uh, antivirals had been developed and uh, both as a oral antiviral as well as IV as a monoclonal antibody. One such drug called Molnupiravir. I want to show one minute on this, how important to do clinical trials. So this drug was developed by a company called Merck by just taking the oral tablet soon after the diagnosis. It prevented almost a 50% chance of death or uh, hospitalization and subsequently it came down to 30%. When this drug was developed, the Indian companies wanted to develop this. Our Indian Council of ICMR, I'll tell you, at the, pa at the pandemic, they said, hey, you have to do a trial now in India in this pandemic to show that whether this drug will work or not. Then only you can market this. Hey, people are dying. We have no drug. How to do this? But they did that in a good justice because earlier we gave hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, lopinavir, none of them worked. So they don't want to repeat this story again. They said, we want an Indian drug. Quickly, we develop a protocol. I was asked to be chair the protocol by the Drug Control of India. It's a, such a large uh, trial I carried on India in the pandemic, you know, that no travel restrictions, everywhere travel restrictions, very difficult to do this across India. So this trial this was developed uh, initially by Hetero, one of the Indian company, now subsequently a lot of companies. So I developed this trial, this phase three trial. You know, they said, hey, phase one and two. I said, I have no idea. People are dying. What to save the people? Now you have to move on. So we have some data on phase two. We put us phase three. They asked some question. Then said, okay, phase two or three. We just moved on on a very large number. And we quickly showed in this side, this drug works. So it prevents hospitalization, very large number of people. It was very safe in the Indian population. And also clinically improved. That's something what we want. You know, we want people who's having severe sore throat and cough quickly improving within two days and three days. And also in this particular trial, we also found that they became negative very quickly in five days. So many times earlier, up to two weeks, people with COVID, they'll be positive. And if they're positive for a longer time, they can transmit to their household members, which you all have seen, whole family infected or the community infected. By giving this drug, it also prevents uh, transmission. We found in that, and it's been safe. And we concluded that it works. And following that immediately, our regulator approved. Even our regulator approved before the US FDA. It's the first time in the history of medicine a drug has been approved by Indian regulator before the US FDA and the European you know, regulator. And following that, there are 13 Indian companies came forward to manufacture this. And we started treating this in the private sector, little in the public, but a lot went to other countries and everything. But again, now this drug is outdated. Now we have got other better drugs. You know, I don't want to bore you further with this. So again, 
there are various types of uh, research you can do in pandemic something again i'll share my experience at the end with the data so during pandemic what we did with this research i think i just wanted to um, end by i don't want to further move on because my other speaker is there by doing all this research in the last uh, 20 25 years so what we did you know in our center we described the various clinical pattern of uh, this disease across india how the indian made drugs are safe tolerable effective in preventing death and opportunistic infection we also describe about the side effects and everything and also we yes conducted different clinical trial to change public policy in who guidelines when to start treatment what to start can we prevent side effects covid drugs and so many other things and many of them have changed the who guidelines this is something you know what we are able to do so again the power of clinical trial is beyond you know where you can change somebody's life you can change a program's life and the whole world's life you know with this i'll end my first part of my talk and give it to my other speaker then again i'll come back to you okay so now we learned what is clinical research and why you should do clinical research and also how to do the research you know to you need to develop a blueprint that is your protocol which you all already developed right you know we just gave you some tips and you developed now where you are going to conduct this clinical research now if you are going to do a survey you can do anywhere you want you know you can do it only in the, the affected area for example you want to know about someone developing breathing problem in a particular locality you can't do it in a hospital you have to go to the particular uh, you know community to do this so you have to choose so i think this part of my talk is on infrastructure and where to do this research but i have prepared in a way that where to do a clinical trial but we also now discuss lot of other types of research so you want to uh, know about this fever so only people who are really sick in covid they came to the hospital but there are a lot of people with fever they never even came out of their bedroom during covid right they are self medicating so if you want to do that you have to go into the community to do that but on the other hand if you want to do the clinical trial whatever you know we have been discussing especially a drug trial it can be done only in certain places it cannot be done everywhere you know because you need certain type of infrastructure you need type of certain personnel you need to have certain type of regulatory mechanism which again my next speaker will speak to you soon and also you need to have a team of staff again clinical trial is not done by a doctor alone or by a investigator alone or a basic scientist you need a team of uh, players which you are going to see that now each regulatory body always uh, takes decision where uh, the trials can be done for example when you want to do a clinical trial like a phase 2 or phase 3 trial in india we have a regulation it can be done only in a tertiary hospital this again keep changes initially i think uh, some 10 years back they said only 100 bedded hospital then everyone fought that hey <laughs> why do you want 100 bedded hospital then they i think now they are limited to 50 bedded i don't know whether they keep seeing this or not again and also in india it should be done both in the private as well as in the government you know this some type of uh, um uh, regulation is there but it's not there in all the countries but this is something what we have in india and when you do clinical trials you're giving anything you even discuss about the fever crusher if you want to do a trial you should be they can even end up in some type of an emergency you know some of those drugs can produce because they are never tried before it can produce severe allergies severe side effects it can cause a permanent damage to your kidneys they can have a kidney damage done so you should be done in a place where these study participants where you are given this drug when they have something happen at the middle of the night if they are coming to you you should have a 24 hour emergency services if you are there in a office like place working between 9 o'clock and 5 o'clock and 5 10 you are locked to your place if your study participant has got some serious issue at 6 o'clock to approach you if you are not there then that's not the right place so right now there is a regulation that it can be done only in place where we have a 24 hour um, emergency service are available and also very importantly next slide please they should have an icu facility also now this is a new requirement for not only in india and many 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 countries because while doing clinical trial they can fall very sick and they die 
right? If you have all the facilities like ventilator, all the acute emergency, ICU doctors, everybody there you can save. Now it could be due to the study medication. There are some study medications we give. It can also produce arrhythmias. It can produce heart attacks. So you need to have a facility where uh, uh, you need to have a monitoring of all those. If they develop anything, side effects, it should be managed. And very importantly, specialty consultants. So you give a drug for infectious disease. But on the other hand, it can cause problem to the kidney, to the liver, it can to the brain or anything. So you need to have a consultant who can help you with all those. So, so this is something, uh, simple regulation. That means you can do it in a hospital like your symbiosis where you have got everything there. You cannot just like do it in a private doctor's clinic or in a small nursing home where uh, two, three specialists come in, they don't have a big ICU, they keep sending everything. You can't do a trial. So now regulators, that is Drug Control of India, when you file an application where you're going to do a trial, they look into all those, whether they have all the proper infrastructure, not only here, in, in every many parts of the world. So again, uh, going back to my own example, you know, our infectious disease clinic, it's inside a large 500-bedded um, hospital with all the specialty inside, 24-hour ICU, 24-hour blood bank, and uh, emergency services and everything, where we have toppled all those uh, research and uh, everything and whatever I said, uh, you know, we showed all the di different trials. Please, next slide, please. Next slide. So again, not only your buildings and your sophisticated, beautiful, clean place, but we need personnel. That's very important. I'm giving an example. So this is a composition of the clinical trials unit which I helped to set up almost 20 years back to mainly to study for HIV uh, drug trials, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Now we are fully repurposed ourselves to COVID and our other emerging diseases. You know, we are looking for other emerging diseases. So it's not just by doctors and investigators alone. It need to have a coordinator who coordinates. Trial is not just giving some medication. You need to have developed the whole place to be set up ready. You need to have study participants come up, training to be done. You need the proper medications and coordinating with the sponsors, with the uh, drug companies, if they are going to get you the drugs, with the laboratory, whether you are doing testing. You need to have a coordinator who need not be a doctor. You know, who, coordinate, who can be somebody from an MBA, from symbiosis can be one of the best uh, research coordinator for uh, big time trial. So you have a huge opportunity, you know, to get uh, positioned in huge pharmaceutical industry for a highly paid uh, salary, you know, for a site coordinator, which they have been looking for people who coordinate that type of trials, where you'll make more money than doctors. And you need a co-investigator. Sometimes when you are a principal investigator, so you are traveling somewhere, you know, today I have so many trials happening in my site, I'm here. So, but I'm responsible, but I always name a co-investigator in my absence where somebody takes care. And also, many times your principal investigators in many trials might be senior professors, your HODs of the department, who have got lots of other work to do. When your study participant come, which has to be reviewed, every time clinic exam, you always have what is called study physician, who are like junior level doctors, who are certified doctors, you know, who need not be a specialist, who can be an MBBS doctor or an MD or uh, some specialty or whatever it might be the particular field, who takes care of uh, routine uh, clinical activities related to the study participants, filling up the clinical component in the case report form. You know, again, when you do trials, it's not just a protocol development alone. You need to collect the appropriate data. For that, you need to have a case report form you know, that has to be filled in. You need appropriate personnel who are qualified and trained in that. And you need research nurses. In the United States and many countries, the trials are run literally by nurses, not by doctors, mainly by nurses, you know. Again, in my unit, trials are uh, main thing coordinated and run by nurses. So we have got a BSc level, MSc level nurses trained uh, to clinical trials to do that. And their main job is to work with the study participants and uh, work with all the case report forms and collect all the clinical data starting from anthropodic measurements like uh, pulse and blood pressure, temperature, and all the um, side effects, uh, they complain and everything. And of course, doctors will be involved along with the nurses. And study counselors, they are the most important. When you say that, the clinical trial, you can't go to some community or to your hospital, patients who are all coming, open their mouth, I'm going to give you a new drug. They are really run away from you, said they are going to test something. So you need to have some type of counselors who speak to a group of patients, hey, now we've got a new drug coming up. 
it will be beneficial if you participate in this trial where uh, you're getting some new data which may change the whole world and everything. You know, counseling a patient, giving proper information. And also, if they are agreed to the trial, we can't immediately put someone on the trial. We've got what is called informed consent process, you know, which again is part of those uh, you know, protocol where you'll have what is called informed consent. So, which again, regulators give different uh, regulations for that. We've got a written informed consent. In India, drug controller now says, you also have to get an audio informed consent. And in most diseases, you also have to have a video recording because there are some study parties who have filed the invest court filed the investigators and they put them in jail. They said they gave something, something happened to me. You didn't never explain to me in the past. So now the court has said, if you are recruiting for some any drug trial, you have to get a written informed consent and whatever you are speaking to them should be audio recorded and also should be video recorded. In certain conditions, the video recording is given away. For example, in HIV for confidentiality and certain other vulnerable population uh, disease uh, trials where we have the waiver. But in COVID, during the emergency, we got a lot of waivers, you know, because we are all in the PPE, getting a proper this audio concern. So there are all several ways we did, but that's not the real case scenario where you need to have an informed concern, which is explained to the study participant by the study counselors, and many times in the presence of a study investigators, and get the return informed concern before we get into that. If the patient is illiterate, then you can get the thumb impression, but there should be a witness who should also sign that, okay, this will properly explained. These are all part of that. That's all done by these uh, counselors along with the investigators and the whole team. And there are some trials which will involve some nutrition products. So doctors are not uh, very good in that or many investigators. So you need to have the proper property. I gave an example, you know, where many times, you know, their nutrition has been involved in that. And we need a lot of social workers and uh, the study retention stuff. Again, the success of a clinical trial is not just recruiting 1,000 patients or 2,000. How you are completing these study procedures, that is, even the follow-up. There are many trials where patients have to come either every week or every month or every three months. Some trials will run for 10 years. So you have to return the study enrolled participant for 10 years to regularly come to you. It's not going to be done by the uh, investigators or by the doctors. not possible because you need to have the phone call, you need to have... Uh, Letters be put if they're all, sometimes you may have to go to the home to find them, whether they are there or not. This is all purely done by our social workers. We call it as cohort retention stuff. They are being trained and explained and how to do this. They also have to be, they can't go to home like a policeman, hey, oh, you did not come here. So you have to be doing in a way that, you know, by giving tender loving care, you know, get them back to the trials. And also, there are a lot of data being collected in these trials. So we need to have a way there, how they are quality assured. They are properly, honestly. Doing a clinical trial, you should have a honesty in that. So there should be a quality assurance, properly collected, whether all data are collected, ethically connected, and all those done by the quality assurance staff. And many interventions involve drugs. So you need to have a dedicated clinical trial pharmacy. There are some drugs which can be stored in the room temperature. Again, the room temperature in Pune is different from Chennai. In Chennai, we have got only two seasons, hot and hottest. So, you know, weather can go to 44 also, you know, so, but in several places it might be different. So you need to have a proper appropriate uh, regulations and everything. You need to have a separate clinical trial pharmacy designed for that. And there are many medications where uh, drugs have to be stored in a refrigerator. During the COVID, we need to have minus 80 defreezers to store certain products like monoclonal antibodies. So you can't do a trial in places where you don't have that. Or if your uh, temperature uh, went down or uh, freezers are not working. So you need to have that type of facility. For example, certain vaccine trials, um, uh, these, some of those mRNA vaccine trials we are not able to do at the beginning in India because it had to be refrigerated at that time because our airports didn't have that. Because they said your hospital can have that, but your uh, Chennai airport didn't have that uh, facility, so we can't store it till that brought to it. So we are not able to do the trials. So I think that type of things are very important for the pharmacy. And again, pharmacy about uh, temperature regulations and study medications, uh, storage, the pharmacy. You need to have a dedicated clinical trial pharmacy. You cannot keep it along with other regular your commercial pharmacy where, uh, again, uh, you don't follow all those ethical uh, uh, principles and trials. So you need to have a dedicated regulatory coordinator. Many times, people who do studies, they cannot do this regulation because then it will be biased. Then you always feel that what you have done is right. There could be individuals who are not part of the trial but knows about the science and studies very well 
always regulates. Hey, you are done in the best way of standard operating procedure. You have followed the protocol what you have just developed and you have collected the data. If it is not there, how you can correct it and everything. I think that should be done by your regulatory coordinator. And when the data is all collected, you need to have a data personnel. You know, but you can't ask anybody to do. You need to be proper trained in that. You need to have a minimum qualification on that, how to use certain things, either in computers or in tablets or in whatever phase it should be done. Now, of course, certain trials are done in only one side. You need to have a good statistician. There are multi-site. You need to have a common uh, bias statistician. And all trials involve some type of a biomarkers. So you need to have a lab where can process all these samples. And also, the lab should have a proper quality assurance. Preferably, should have a, a NABL certified lab. And also, many trials, what we do, like NIH, not only NABL, we also should certify with our uh, regulatory bodies, that is by NIH, whether these assays are uh, past certain quality assurance mechanisms. Although, so you need to have a, uh, the lab scientists consists of microbiologists, virologists, immunologists, biochemists, depending upon whatever study you have been involved, and proper uh, lab technicians with appropriate techniques and blibotomies. You know, um, uh, in India, everybody draws blood sample, you know, but by law, they are not, not everyone are uh, certified to do that. In the U.S., only certain people can draw a blood sample. In India, everybody does. So again, but in clinical trial, when you do regulatory, we need to have certain certified blibotomies part of the trial. I think that is very, very, very important. And even if you have all those, you can't do a trial. This is very important, admin. You know, I have a research administrator who has been involved in a lot of paperwork, working with the sponsors, working with the uh, clinicians, working with the investigators and everything, recruiting people, you know, um, make sure that uh, they're all paid. This is very important. If you don't pay the research staff on time, they will not come. So what happened to the participants and everything? So big ethical concern. So you need to have a proper administrators who understand. Here again, your MBAs can be hugely helpful for our uh, clinical trial doing this administration. And contracts. I'll tell you, we do a lot of pharmaceutical industrial trials. So many contracts we need to go through. Many of us even don't uh, know ho all those legal implications. They come in certain bond paper. <laughs> Sometimes we are afraid. So we need to have certain uh, personnel who are very good in uh, understanding these legal issues and law because the, some of those wordings will be there. If you don't proper, you'll be put in jail. <laughs> and they'll say, hey, what is this all behind? So you need to have a proper personnel who reviews and also negotiates certain terms, especially in the shipping specimens across, data sharing, and so many things. You need to have an appropriate personnel. You need to have a very strong finance officer. It's not just doing a trial, getting money and doing that. Because the reporting, because the money which is received for research should be used only for that. If it has been used for some other purpose, that comes under fraudulent. Either it's a money by any pharmaceutical industry or by the Indian government like ICMR or by WHO or US by NIH and federal governments. It's under the criminal offense. So we need to have a proper finance officer who controls that also. And certain um, uh, sponsor agencies like ICMR, they ask for hundreds of documents. You know, if you have been doing ICMR trial, whether uh, how you have utilized, you know, your bank statements and so many things of the institution, so many things. So you need to have a separate personnel who understands that to do that. And very importantly, any institution who is conducting trial, they need to have their own ethics committee and their institutional review committee. They should have a member secretary. That person is not part of the clinical trial, but you need to have a lot of coordination with that particular. That can be a doctor, it can be a personnel, anything, PhDs, anybody who coordinates uh, with the ethics committee to do this. Only if you have all those, you can do all those trials, whatever I said, phase two, phase three uh, trials. Otherwise, you'll not be able to do in a good ethical way. You'll be able to complete the trial in an acceptable way by the uh, regulators. Not only having all these people, but you need to have the proper qualified staff. India is a huge country. You know, we have billions of people. Many are talented, super talented. So we have all the talents available in India. So we don't need to go to... Um, recruiting staff uh, below their uh, qualification. For each one, we need to look into that. And many research uh, sponsors, they look into the qualification of each staff. It is uh, doctors, our own registration, nurses registration, pharmacy council registration. Each one is very, very important. And every trial, every staff should go through what is called GCP training, good clinical practice. So that means you follow certain basic principles. I'm not sure whether Sanish will talk to you next about those uh, ICH rules and everything. I didn't have those slides. Probably um, you can little touch upon that. So as part of that, uh, uh, you know, everyone have to go through those training. If there are people who left, new people come, we keep doing that. And when we involve people in trials, 
not only we discuss them and train them about the uh, study protocols and uh, uh, and study procedures but also signs about that uh, particular disease for example if i'm going to do a trial on hepatitis b first i will teach all my uh, clinical trial staff on hepatitis b they need to know what is hepatitis b how it is caused how it causes a disease what are the organ is going to cause what are the symptoms they will develop what are the currently available treatment then um, you know we do this so again if you don't do that they will not do a good justice because the study participant might ask so many questions so they need to know about the signs then about the study protocol then about the detailed study procedures what are those things to be done so all should be dealt not only to the nurses but also to the pharmacists and everyone will know about the detail about all those so these are all training we import on all the stuff and again this is a, a little quick pictures and i'm not showing all the detailed pictures of our clinical trials unit now some other things are very confidential because we do so many um uh, interventional trials uh, my trials is predominantly supported by nih but who and a lot of other bodies we have very strong clinical trials unit you know uh, have conducted nearly 50 different randomized trials enrolled more than 10000 intervention participants you need to have a clinical trial pharmacy should have uh, temperature regulation i just took only one picture in each zone will have one type of uh, temperature that's why i said no sometime a temperature can be 45 in the room temperature so it will give an alert hey something going happening you have to increase uh, air conditioners uh, to certain level there will be two or three air conditioners in one room one fails other will work so these are some of the requirements you need to uh, follow and how you keep the medical records uh, section if you have a double door you'll have a um, access code you'll have a camera who enters and not because these are all confidential data should not be stolen you know and should have a fire extinguishers all those uh, detailed uh, you know things will be there and we need to have a quality assurance the quality assurance person should not sit along with other regular uh, study staff which i showed here then there won't be any quality assurance so we keep in a place that that person is out of bounds to others whose job is only to look into each records and everything only find uh, some faults and correct with all those before the data management next is a data management we have different types of data management computer entry tablet entry data faxing and everything and also when you do a good clinical trial you should arrange in a way that your mrd section qc data management should be in a place very close by you should not keep in the mrd section in the third floor data management on ground floor and qc and so on so you have to keep on moving your files from one to another there is a breach of confidentiality there is a loss and so many things so you should be a good clinical trial should be synchronized in the same floor same level and all should be done some of our staff in the part of the trials unit many of them working with me for 20 years you know along with that still young <laughs> so um, and when you have a lab you make sure that uh, you have all the facilities and quality assurance if you don't have that you have to participate in a um, uh, central laboratory so many sponsors pharmaceutical company won't allow you to do all the assays they usually ship it to a um, centralized lab just for the quality assurance and for the uniformity and if you are having equipments you are using in your for research purposes you make sure that these equipments really work properly they are all properly audited they have all the certifications in place and they have all those amc contracts with the companies and everything because you are doing a study to and again it is all studies validated based on the reports of this machine especially some of those molecular uh, assays you are using as a primary endpoint the equipments are not working properly then you will be end up in a suit so again the technical expertise is available for these reasons many times sponsors use central labs so so this is, you know we work with many universities across the globe and with many funding agencies which is able to do many many trials and again i like to tell you that you now we are into this business of doing clinical care and research for more than 25 years uh, which has led to many publications and changing policy and one thing i like to tell you that and in my talk today by doing a research my team is a better clinicians because when you do clinical trials you do clinical care in a much more evidence based very scientifically ethically very honestly and up to date so if you do research you are up to date so if a hospital does research you can safely go to the hospital for clinical care that means many of the doctors are very up to date they follow guidelines not all most of them so with this i'll stop this part of my talk i will again come back after dr sanish thank you again i think we do the analysis as per how the protocol has been developed you know usually so because when we calculate sample size we always calculate to get uh, power to get based on the hypothesis you know if it has been anything is done differently 
many times you won't get a good significance. But I just wanted to you know, highlight a couple of things, uh, especially as part of this uh, session. What are you going to use with this data, right? So many times we do research. People write uh, their own uh, MD thesis, PhD thesis, or your bachelor thesis and do for it. Some of you use this, go to a conference, your regional conference, or a national or a international conference, and put it in your CV, hey, I presented. Some of you out of that go and publish in a journal, you know, where it can be a local journal, international journal, anywhere, get it, get it done. So, so whatever data, what do you have, disseminate. Don't keep it with you. If you keep it with you, it's only for you or for your department or anything. If you disseminate the important research, what do you do? Many people are going to see it. Either they use it for some purpose or not, that's a different story. You know, if it is high impact, people use it. Otherwise, they're not going to reference it. You know, you have to disseminate in many, many ways. And one other thing um, which uh, industry does this uh, uh, clinical trial is either phase one or two or three trials is they use the data then submit to the regulatory body to review the data, whether uh, these drugs can be certified to do this marketing license. To do that, we as investigators, we have to do this trial in a good ethical, scientific way, in appropriate way, because that data is going to really give a life to the drug and to the company who have invested millions of dollars in developing the molecule. So if you do this in a very ethical way, get the good data, that's going to be certified and approved for use. And doctors are going to prescribe on you, whether you have a headache or throat pain or whatever it might be, then you're going to get a good uh, impact on that. I think how we are going to use the data is also important. We use the data a different way. And you do trials for, we use for regulations and also for academically publish. I sit on many guidelines committees, you know, nationally as uh, internationally in infectious disease, particularly with the WHO in HIV, hepatitis, and now in COVID, a lot of committees. So when we look at data, we don't look at the, everybody who writes you know, to make guidelines. Then the guidelines itself like a book and everybody will get confused. So we had to look into you know, what each one have studied, whether they have proper uh, sample size, it was done in a good uh, ethical way, properly designed uh, study. And based on that, we do what is called grading. So in uh, developer guidelines, for each studies which have been published, they have like A1, A2, A3 grading, B1, B2, B3, C1, C2, C3. So any randomized clinical trials, what we all uh, today discuss, like phase one, phase two, phase three, good trials with good sample size, significance, and good outcome always will rank as A1, A2. And something from the uh, qualitative study and epidemiological surveys can come under B1, B2, and many individual case reports and case series come under the level of evidence C1 because they can have biases. So, so we don't use just like the data for changing guidelines or policies. They're all graded you know, based on that, you know, um, you know, the guidance are done. Because there are a lot of research happening across the globe, not only in India and in China and you know, everywhere people do different, different trials for certain indication using certain medications. So it's all being used and based on that this uh, guidance had been, you know, used. Right? And don't go with what media tells many times. You know, when, you know, during the COVID time, they wanted everything from our mouth and say that this drug works and everything. You know, so that is to run their program and, you know, they get um, <laughs> chewed up. But it's something what you have to go with these good reputed journals, you know, what they publish and uh, good conferences and good meetings, you know, what uh, researchers, you know, talk to you. I think that's important from that, you know, you should take into that. So I don't want to add anything more. So um, might be we can take questions, you know, because uh, this is session might be a few minutes we have to close. Any questions you have on clinical research? Now we are here speaking to you for the last almost three, year, three hours. So we'll be very happy to answer. Maybe you can provide a microphone in between. Already Symbiosis Hospital is doing research. So you can also observe them, what they are doing, because they would have gone through all this exercise. They are um, clinicians, they are researchers, and get involved. Coffee time. Yes. Yeah, yeah, wait for the mic.
Now, how many of you want to do research and be part of the research team? After hearing all this, and you have a lot of opportunity, you can lift your hand. You all want to join a research unit in whatever uh, background you are? Yeah, there are some hands, somebody's nodding their head. Yeah, sure, please. Yeah, let, let, let the first hey. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, so my question is, um, I will give you some background uh, for me, is that I've started my own podcast series where I'm looking for individuals who are doing clinical research uh, for behavior therapy. So what happens is, the, I have the same approach that people are there who are working in the industry and doing all those uh, years of experience, uh, clinical studies and all the experimenting and after that they get some solid research which can be useful for the general masses. But when I approach those kind of individuals, they are not very open to sharing those ideas. So I don't understand ki they have done the research, uh, they have got the uh, outcome that they were looking for good and the bad and there are some important factors which needs to be discussed on a much more larger scale apart from the academic point of view. So uh, there is a very key point that everything is done okay uh, but people are still not very open to sharing those ideas. Sharing the results of their study or their? Yeah, yeah. So sharing their studies. Yeah. For example, uh, like you have uh, invested whole life uh, for the HIV. And you have multiple, you have done multiple research and everything. So people like me, when I come up to you for asking, ki, okay, let's have, let's sit together and have a conversation, so that we can, uh, or what do you call, um, easy the language, uh, so that it's much more easy and comfortable for the masses to understand. But they are not uh, yeah. open you to share. I, I understand. I'm not sure that we can answer. That's a personality individual, right? So. Um, I'm not sure it varies from individual to individual. There are some people who done something, they don't want to discuss, they want, don't want to encourage others to come up. So I'm, I'm not sure what to answer to your question. <laughs> okay, so, okay. You know, it varies from individual. Probably you should try to open that person's mouth to get the answer. I okay. think, you know, you might be good in that. Yeah. Thank you so you much. You got some questions. Question is about sustainability. So somebody like uh, Symbiosis who has just started out, uh, COVID times, we had a flood of uh, clinical trials, and then they seem to have dried up because, you know, con contextual departments need to be set up. We need to have patient base, and we need to have primary data. So now, how do we make this whole thing sustainable? Yeah. So th this is a million-dollar question. You know, you saw my clinical trials unit. It invested 20 years back. The staff now, many of them are growing with clinical research. So we would have started with a small peanut salary, but now in 20 years, they might be <laughs> making several zeros to their uh, uh, initial salary. So again, sustaining such a high quality clinical research site is very difficult. I think it's a um, uh, role of the investigators, keep writing project proposals, negotiating with their collaborators and sponsors, uh, getting money. Because in India, we don't have anything like a, some type of uh, seed funding from the government to do that. They do that for their own institutions. For example, ICMR, so they have their own uh, research institutions. They have here in Pune, they have National AIDS Research Institute Pune. So they are continuously funded, so they can do trials or studies, you know, and NIV, virology. And in, in Chennai, we have National Institute of TB Research. So I think hospitals like your symbiosis and even our own institutions, I know it's very difficult you have to continuously roll on. Otherwise, even staff will go away. Many of my staff have gone to pharma industry and uh, all to other clinical research organization after spending many years and highly expertise. So sustaining that is not that easy. Do you have any other ways where? So I think uh, the most important thing is to make these networks. Uh, initial years are going to be really tough. Uh, but making networks, uh, say simple things like, for example, uh, working with uh, the critical care society and kind of like saying that, okay, we are ready to kind of do some studies, some uh, multi-centric academic studies. Initially, when you're part of these academic studies, which may not be high budget and other things, and your, your time and maybe a couple of people's involvement is all that is required, you get that initial one. And then you maybe present your, your that participation or that paper in, in the... ISC, ISCCM conference, uh, 
and then people start to notice oh uh, they do they do studies and then you get to the eyes of uh, some of the sponsors whether it is indian companies or others it may not be a ground breaking research that comes to you but it it slowly starts then you can hire maybe one or two more additional clinical research coordinators who kind of like are willing to actually stay with you then you uh, do another publication etc so it, you, you can't expect it to kind of like suddenly have a linear <laughs> scale kind of a situation but it's it's a slow and steady thing you anyways have a lot of work otherwise also training teaching etc so research becomes one other additional part of uh, the work that you do there was one more question so when we write proposals uh, we get stuck at uh, providing insurance hmm. uh, even if it is an observational trial so i mean i give you a simple example so we were trying to randomize groups to uh, giving high dose vitamin b12 for mild covid patients and uh, you know standard dose vitamin b12 and b6 for the, uh, the similar kind of patients so even though these are i mean everybody was prescribing vitamins right but because now then it became an intervention correct uh, they asked for insurance so our ethics committee said no insurance no uh, approval so this kind of a situation so then how do we tackle the insurance business yeah you you can talk about your institution this yeah. thing so, but so i think i think this insurance business you know you have to follow the the country's regulation uh, today the country regulation icm argues is you have to protect the study participants take care of all the injuries providing free care in terms of death and do all those i think the only way where we can do everything all those whatever based on there is to provide medical insurance mm -hmm. in india we have got few companies so they are providing medical insurances for clinical trials including for hiv you know all our trials have been insured during the covid times and everything and even for your b12 i'm sure they'll provide but i know it costs a budget you know it has yeah. got a premium behind it so you have to invest that as part of your uh, grant uh, to do that it is again for your own safety yeah, so absolutely. the minute when something happens if you're not providing the participant can sue you you know so yeah. i think because the regulators will only support the participant yeah so because that's part of the law so i think uh, that has to be insured um but again the trial what is said is definitely not observational it's purely interventional yeah the observational studies you don't need any um, uh, clinical trials uh, insurance so inter it's needed only for yes. any intervention even already approved drugs if you are going to study it should be insured yeah yeah so that i realized and and I also you need to have a commitment group. from your hospital management yes. any study participant who falls sick they need to be provided free treatment including so icu care and everything we are already doing yes. so that was not the issue yeah. the issue was to kind of re now other compensations yeah. like for example yeah. in case of the death what happens or some of the care what cannot be provided But plus it was covid so you yeah. be, it yeah. would be very difficult to prove association or no, no association between death so and so many many institutions have what they call as the umbrella research insurance which is like all the research that is going on in the institution is under an umbrella insurance so that you don't have to kind of like every time go for insurance you just tell the in insurance agent that there is one more study and this is uh, the number of patients and this is the, they have their own assessment that they need but uh, for an institution which keeps on increasing the your initial umbrella insurance might be lower but as the number of studies increase the insurance can increase but then for that i think you will be able to have sponsors who will be willing to actually chip into that so that could be one discussion that you could have with your management thank you okay. any other question if not again thank you for the opportunity i think we had a great time chatting with you all thanks thank you so much